Running your own node is a must when it comes to becoming a first class Bitcoin citizen. And that is why today I am very excited to be taking a look at the next generation of Bitcoin nodes with Qubit. Let's jump in. Now, first things first, if you're newer to the idea of Bitcoin nodes and you're wondering why you might want to run one, I have done a whole video on that topic that I would invite you to take a look at in my running a node playlist on the channel. But if you're more familiar, you know that there are a number of combinations now of different hardware you can use, different node softwares, etc. And so a lot of people to start go with something like the Raspberry Pi 4. This is a classic. It's a very simple single board computer on which you can run a full Bitcoin node. And the reason a lot of people use it is it's very accessible, but the downside is it can be a little more fragile, particularly if you're planning to use this as not just a Bitcoin node, but also potentially uh, a general home server where you're you know, self-hosting your data and other things like that. And even if you're not planning to do those things, there can still be issues with something like a Raspberry Pi 4. If you're planning to run anything more than like a hobby lightning node, maybe you're a business or a merchant that you want to self-host, you know, BTC pay server and accept payments over Bitcoin. Maybe you're a content creator. You want to accept donations in a similar fashion. You know, if you have anything other than a very, very, very small amount of sats on your lightning node, you probably want to at least consider whether beefier hardware is something that you'd want to go with. And so from a hardware standpoint, the Qubit is substantially superior to a Raspberry Pi 4. The computer in this case is over four times faster than the Raspberry Pi 4. It comes with a one terabyte SSD NVMe uh, drive, which is very nice. It's nice for speed. Basically, it's just way more performant. But what's also really unique about the Qubit is in addition to that NVMe drive that it comes with, you can also hook up an additional two drives, two SSDs, which you could then set up some sort of RAID redundancies. RAID stands for redundant array of independent disks. And so again, if you're running a more substantial lightning node or whatever it is, you can mirror the data from one drive to another. And so if one drive crashes for whatever reason, you still have data integrity and you don't potentially lose your funds on Lightning or whatever the case may be. So that's a big deal. And again, definitely something you want to consider if you're doing this in anything more than a hobby or even if you are, I think it's worth looking at the beefier hardware option that you get with the Qubit. It also doesn't hurt that it happens to look very clean as well. The design for this thing is quite beautiful. So that's the hardware. Major upgrade to what a lot of people start off with in terms of the Raspberry Pi 4. And then importantly, we also wanna consider the software. Now, one of the more popular node implementations is of course Umbral. And I like Umbral. I have done a whole set of tutorials on building an Umbral node from scratch, flashing Umbral operating system onto your node, all this sort of stuff. But of course, if you go with Umbral, you're locked into Umbral by definition. The Qubit node is compatible with many different node implementations, uh, including Umbral, but also things like Start9, also things like MyNode. And as we will be going into in the tutorial, Citadel. And in fact, the plug and play version of Qubit, I believe, comes with Citadel on it. Just as some quick context on Citadel, Citadel is a completely community-funded, fully, fully, fully open source node implementation. It actually started as a fork uh, of Umbral, and it was an ex-developer of Umbral that started this. There was some drama and all this and that, but in any case, for people that are looking for the absolutely most pure, FOSS, free and open source software option, Citadel arguably does have Umbral beat in that regard because as we can see, Citadel has the GNU GPL and GNU Ape GPL license, meaning it is fully open source. No one can restrict you in terms of how you use it. Whereas Umbral does have that polyform non-commercial license, which they moved to in 2021. So to be clear, you can still look at the Umbral code. You can still fork it. You can still use it for personal uh, use but you can't use it for commercial purposes. Now, again, 
there's some who would look at that and say, well, you know, that's trivial as long as I have source viewable, that's what's important to me. But again, for those of you that want pure, pure, pure FOSS, Citadel is arguably the choice there. And there are some other differences here as we can see. It looks like Citadel has some tighter permissioning around the apps, so different apps that you want to add to your node in addition to Bitcoin and Lightning it has a stricter permissioning system, which is helpful and important. There is a claim from Citadel that Umbral tracks your IP address. This is apparently somewhat standard for versioning updates. Again, I'm not sure I haven't dove into some of that uh, very closely, but that is potentially another consideration. So in any case, the summary is that Qubit offers significantly better hardware and then the optionality in terms of node software, which is nice. If you're coming to this video interested in the Qubit and you don't yet have it, you can go and check them out at their Geyser page. And so again, there's going to be the plug and play version of that. And then for those of you that prefer to build it yourself, there is the do it yourself kit. And so for the rest of today's video, I'm gonna be going through the tutorial for the do it yourself version. Even if you do end up getting the plug and play, I still think it's interesting to know what's happening uh, in each of the components. And so that is what we're going to go through today. And so then if you are going to follow along with the tutorial and the do-it-yourself installation, you're going to need the do-it-yourself kit from their Geyser page. If you want to attach additional drives to this thing, you can get that as well. I will flash up an example uh, of a drive that I have found to work well. And then you are also going to want a USB stick. Again, assuming you're going to go and follow along do-it-yourself style. That USB stick is going to be used for flashing Ubuntu, which is a Linux uh, operating system distribution that we are going to use as part of our setup. And then as you will see, I do have a keyboard and monitor that I will be connecting to the device so that we can step through that Ubuntu installation process. So that's the context and the ingredient list. One last just quick disclaimer. Obviously this is a newer project, both Qubit and Citadel. So do be aware that this is early for both of these projects. But I think as you'll agree after watching the tutorial, very, very promising stuff and really can help individuals take their self-sovereignty to the next level. But with all that, let's jump into the tutorial, starting first with the hardware assembly. All right, so let's do a quick tour of what we have we of course have the case itself. So we have the bottom of the case, as you can see. We've got the top of the case, as you can see. And then we've got the main sort of body of the case that everything is going to go in. We have got the Odroid H3 board, which you can see in all its glory. Importantly, and we'll talk about this, we've got the two ports on the side here that are going to allow for multiple SSDs to be connected, which is very cool. And this is also going to come with a drive on the bottom. And if you look really closely, I don't think you'll be able to see it on camera, but that's a one terabyte drive. So you could, in theory, just boom, go right away and start setting this up. Uh, that is definitely enough space for the Bitcoin blockchain currently. Although number one, if you want to be more future looking, it's worth considering having more disk space than that. And depending on what all you want to do with this, it would also be a great opportunity. And that is one of the big differentiators here is the ability to add multiple SSDs. I have got a simple crucial 2.5 inch SSD. This is one terabyte. This is primarily what we're gonna to use today. And importantly, if you do want to add in additional SSDs of your own, be sure that they have this sort of format. I know it's hard to see, but you can see how there is a complete severing between these two pieces, as opposed to the following, which as you can see has more of this sort of singular piece, right? There's not a, there's not a clean severing between that. And so what that means is that these included SATA data cables are not gonna fit this type of model. So that is just a quick plug. Uh, this simple, crucial one terabyte, this is like less than $50 on Amazon if you wanna grab this. Samsung has some very good ones as well. 
But again, just ensure that you have the right format for the connection there. We also get the uh, this little mounting. So this is gonna be the case where we mount the SSDs and they're gonna sit inside that. So again, you can, and again, you can have up to two of them held in this. We've got a little CMOS battery. This is sort of a, I guess, a backup, or it helps with um, managing the clock time and startup uh, of the computer. So we'll have that to plug in. We also have this handy LED power button. So that is what's going to sit outside of the box there that we can use to turn on the device. Very cool there. Uh, of course, we get an Ethernet cable. This is what we're going to use to plug in later. We have a uh, power supply along with the respective adapter, if appropriate. And then finally, we have got this handy fan that we are also going to install to keep the machine cool. And then you can see there's a lot of zip ties, uh, you know, all the screws you need, all that sort of stuff. So we're gonna get started with the board and the base first, and then we're going to build up from there. Okay, so step one, we are going to get the board affixed to the base. As you will see, there are four holes in the board. And of course, those are going to go into the four holes on the base, and we're going to screw uh, that in. So we will do that and be right back. Okay, so we've got the board affixed. That should be on there nice and good. We're going to put this aside for the moment. And we are going to now focus on the main sort of case and box here. Now, as a quick heads up, what you actually want to do first, the very first thing you want to do is get the fan mounted to the side. And the reason for that is you want to actually be using these silicon screws, which require quite a bit of force to kind of pull them in. And so to get that on both the top as well as the bottom of the fan, you're gonna want all this other stuff to not be in the box. That was something I didn't do in the original construction of this. And so that step one is getting the fan on. So don't be alarmed if in a few seconds you see that portion with some of the other stuff already built in, that's fine. If you're following along at home, you'll do the fan first and then everything else that follows in the video. And so if you look inside, you'll see these two little prongs. That is what we are going to use to line up to the SSD case. So that guy is going to sit in there just like that. So first, let's get the additional SSD that we're gonna be using for today uh, into the card. And so you'll want the, the ports here uh, to be on the side of the two prongs for the data cable to work correctly. So we'll just slide that guy in. So we've got it in like that. Now, if you want to affix it a little more securely, there are the little screw holes on the other side that you can use to really mount the drive to the holder. So we're gonna do that and be right back. All right, so we've got this screwed in so that drive is not gonna slide out. And then now what we're gonna do is get the data cable connected to it. So I've got one of the pair of data cables that you will receive. And so I'm going to plug this bigger size one into that side of the SSD. And then this guy is going to plug in right next to it. So that's the SSD. Again, you could add a second one right underneath this guy. Quick note, if you are going to be doing the RAID 1 or exploring that type of setup, uh, I think you ideally do want two of the, two of the exact same uh, SSDs. And so what we're gonna do now is we are going to affix these two prongs to the indentations. There we go. So as you can see, place the two prongs and that'll feel pretty tight, uh, but you know, you do wanna screw those in of course. So we'll go ahead and do that. And so next we're going to feed the power button through. See there's a little washer type guy uh, on that. So we're just going to twist that off real quick. And we're gonna feed this through the circular button shaped hole there, like so. And then for the button, you'll see that gets nice and flush. 
and then we will put the the washer back on. All right, so we've now got the very sleek power button flush to the box. That is looking very nice. Now, what you wanna do is feed these guys down through. You'll see it's gonna to be tough, to, a little bit tough to see on camera, uh, but once you have your hands on this, it'll make sense. There's this little sort of groove that you will feed these down, that they're gonna be coming down in the right area for connection into the board. So as you can see, I have fed these wires down. I suppose you could probably do this before putting in the SSD. Uh, that might make it a little bit easier. But as you can see, they are fed all the way down through this groove, and I now have those four wires here along with the data cable uh, that we're all going to plug in momentarily. And then before we connect everything up to the board, the final piece we're gonna add is the fan. And so you'll kind of see it has this uh, cord sort of surrounding it. And so really you want about, like if you were to roll it all the way back up, you want about two segments worth uh, of the cord. Just so you have that to plug in and you're going to want the Arctic logo pointing into inward into the machine, right? So you put the cord in there and then this guy sits just like that and we will screw it in so that it's pulling air through the grated side of the box. So we'll do that and we'll be right back. And again, just reiterating back to the earlier point in the video, you will actually do the fan first within this kind of body of the case. That'll just make things easier because you will want to use the silicone, the kind of uh, black rubbery screws instead of the metal screws. So again, just a reminder there. We have now got the LED light the SSD case and the fan all mounted in the box. And so now the task is to connect these two pieces together. We're gonna connect everything up to the board. Before we even do that, we've got this little CMOS battery. And so you'll see this little white kind of switch there uh, near this side of the board, near those two Right, so that little white guy, we are going to plug this in, like so. And that guy's just gonna kinda hang out here. And then do the following. So you can see all the, all the wires coming out the bottom here. So let's start with the top side of the board. So this is where you're going to plug data cables in from your SSD. And again, there are those two pieces. There's this guy right there, which is going to connect into one of these, right? And then you have this second connection, which is going to plug into one of these. Second, you've got the fan wiring. And you can kind of see it's sort of this weird, you've got kind of this piece hanging off, so ignore that. And what you want is this little guy. And what that's gonna do is you're gonna put it on these four pins. So those four guys is what we're going to connect the fan uh, connection to. And then finally, and this is a little, little tricky, we're going to connect the four wires. So there's black, red, green, and blue on the LED. And we're gonna plug those into the appropriate pins on this 24 pin header here on the board. And the way to count this is it starts at one in the upper right and then the one immediately below that is two. And then as we move across, it's three on the top and then four on the bottom and then five and then six and then seven and then eight and so on and so forth. So uh, odd numbers are on the top 
and even numbers are on the bottom. And we're moving from the middle of the board, sort of, to the outside. So the bigger numbers are near the outside. And so the way to configure this is the black wire gets connected up to pin number one. The red wire, we're going to connect to pin number four. So they'll sort of be diagonal to each other, one in the very top right, and then directly down into the left of that wire will be the red one. Okay, and then in the original voiceover, I realized I switched the order of blue and green. So you're just gonna follow what is on the screen. The blue one is pin 19, and the green one is pin 17. I'm gonna try and throw up some close-up pictures and diagrams if I can in the editing, but that is what we're gonna do next. Okay, so. I'm gonna try and show some of that more close up. I'm not sure how well that's going to show up. I think that's probably pretty decent. So there you can see nearest uh, by thumb, you've got the fan connection. And then of course, furthest away from my thumb, you have got the different colored cords, colored wires. And then on the other side, you have got the data cables plugged in as well. This other little fan guy just kind of uh, can sit here just like that. Um, and now we can go ahead and close this up. And so there we go. As you can see, it's now nice and flush along all the different ports, nice little power button. And so the final step here is going to be screwing the base into uh, the body. So we've got the base. Connected to the body, we've got everything nice and flush. We've got the LED, we've got everything wired up to the board. We can now put this handsome little uh, top on. So that's the assembly. And so we've got this handy ethernet cord that is going to get plugged into one of the uh, ethernet ports there. And finally, you've got the power adapter, which gets plugged in like so, looking fresh. Now that we've built the hardware, the next step, of course, is going to be all the software. And there's two components to this. First, we're going to need to flash a operating system. In our case, we're going to use Ubuntu, which is a Debian-based Linux distribution. And once we have that, we are going to install the Citadel node software specifically. Well, let's head to that first piece now. Okay, so for that first piece, I am on ubuntu.com slash download slash server. I will put all these relevant links in the description down below. So what we are going to do is grab this option one for a manual server installation. And so we'll go ahead and download this. So that is downloaded. And now what we want is just a regular USB. I've got a 32 gig SAN disk here, but it can be anything. The file size we just downloaded is about two gigs, so you'll need at least that. But we're going to get this into the computer. And then you are going to want to download a program called Belina Etcher, which you can get from etcher.belina.io. And what this is going to allow us to do is to flash or basically get the operating system file that we just downloaded onto our USB safely. So let's pop this open. You can see that it has read in my USB device. So that's what goes in the middle. And then we are going to flash from file and we're gonna simply pick from our downloads what we just downloaded. So we've got the Ubuntu server image, the ISO file. We've got our USB. Let's go ahead and flash this. All right, so we have got the USB all flashed. We have got our qubit uh, connected to power. As you can see, you can kind of hear it, hear the fan humming a little bit. And then we also have a keyboard and a monitor connected into this so that we can step through the installation process before we get this to its final sort of resting place connected to the internet and such. So I'm going to plug this in, in addition to my keyboard, monitor, and the power. All right, and so this is now installing. I missed just a little bit of that. What you need to do is just press the power button on the qubit after you put in the USB, and then turn it back on. 
And so once you reboot it, it will detect the USB and then you will see hard kernel and then you'll see an option that says try and install Ubuntu server. And so you can either hit enter to begin the process or it'll just go automatically. And so we're going to give this some time to install. All right, and so eventually you will land on this. Um, sorry, the camera is a little goofy here. I'm kind of shooting this in, in a weird way. Uh, but you can now use the keys of your keyboard to select your language. So we'll go ahead and hit enter for English. And then there's a little menu that just says done at the bottom, which we will hit okay. And similarly, we're choosing the base for the installation. So we're gonna leave it as the default option that is already selected at the top. This just says Ubuntu server. So now it's prompting us for network connections. We're going to hit the option again, just to see what I'm doing here at the bottom, that option that says continue without network for the time being, because we are going to eventually plug this directly into our internet router at home using an ethernet cord once we've finished this initial operating system installation. So we're just gonna continue without network for now. Once again, we will just hit enter here. We're not gonna use any sort of mirroring and we're going to continue without updating. We're going to leave the default here as well and we'll go ahead and hit done. And it says select and continue below will begin the installation process and result in the loss of data on the disks selected to be formatted, so do be advised of that depending on what hard drives you're using as part of this process, you will not be able to return to this or a previous screen once the installation has started. Are you sure you wanna continue? We will say yes. And so now we're going to set up our sort of profile and, in, and this information is important, particularly the password for accessing the device. So we'll go ahead and put some information in here. We will skip Ubuntu Pro. And we do want this, so we'll hit enter. And so once we're done with this process, we're going to move the qubit and connect it directly to the router. And then we're going to remote access that device using our other laptops. We're gonna SSH into the qubit. And so we want this uh, to install as well. We're not gonna import anything. And so we will go ahead and hit done. And so it's now going to install the system and the installation process is complete. All right, so we've installed Ubuntu server on our qubit and what I'm going to do now is remove and unplug all of this. I'm going to then get this to its final resting place where we will connect the power supply and then also the ethernet cable directly into my internet router. And then for the final step of this process, we are going to be installing Citadel. All right, and so we have got the power supply for the qubit plugged in, and we've also got it connected to the router via the provided ethernet cable. We've installed Ubuntu server on this bad boy, and so now it is time to power this guy on. And then we are going to SSH into this to install Citadel. Okay, so the final step is to get Citadel onto the machine. At runcitadel.space, you can see the main website. You can also see that they have these files, but they're only for Raspberry Pi currently. So I imagine you will have downloadable packages for the Odroid before too long. And again, if you're doing the plug and play version of the qubit you anyways don't have to worry about any of this but if you're doing the do-it-yourself version do be aware of that and so for our purposes today we are going to be running everything from the command line and of course we first need to remote connect into the qubit and so we are going to ssh into the qubit and so to do that we are going to run the command ssh and then all you need is the name of whatever you put for your name in the Ubuntu installation process at, and then the server IP or the host name if you have it. And so one way you can do this is you can run something called angry IP scanner. You can just uh, download this and then hit start. 
and it's going to scan all the different P's that your internet service provider has assigned to various devices that are connected to your home network. And so for example, you can see my umbral that is created and the IP that my router has assigned it. For some strange reason, I don't see the host name of the qubit coming up. I'm not sure why that is, but I do know that the IP we're looking for is this one. If you need to figure out which of the IPs being assigned, you can once again connect a monitor keyboard to your qubit. And then if you hit any key, you will see the ability to log in using your username and the password we created in the Ubuntu installation process. And then you will see the IP address that is being assigned. So that is one way you can figure out the correct IP. Again, I'm not sure why the host name is not showing up in this case, but in any case, we will just copy this guy, come back to our command line and paste that in. So we are connecting and then it will prompt us to put in the password that we chose during the Ubuntu installation process. And so there we go. You can see we are now SSH'd into Ian at Qubit, which is the name that I gave the machine earlier. And so now we are going to run a series of commands to install. I will paste these commands in the description down below so that you can grab them easily. And so first we are going to get something called Docker by running the following command. Docker is basically used to containerize applications and other software as the Citadel packages we're going to be installing in this case. So we're gonna go ahead and run this command. And in order to do this, we're going to re-enter our password. So we've got Docker. Next, we are going to install a couple of different dependencies that are required in order to install Citadel. And so that command is the following. We're going to grab, as you can see, a couple little, a couple different pieces, a couple Python 3 pieces, just so we can run Citadel after we download it. So let's go ahead and run this. All right, so we've got Docker, we've got the dependencies. Now we are going to run the following to download Citadel itself. Now the final step is to actually run it. So we're gonna run this command to start up Citadel. All right, and so as we can see, once it's run through that process, you can see that Citadel is now accessible at the following. So similar to how you would go into your web browser to access Umbral if you're running something like Umbral, we can now do the same thing for qubit.local. So let's copy this. In some cases, I'm not sure why this happens, but the qubit.local may or may not resolve. So you can always just put in the IP address uh, that we used. And so here we are, welcome to Citadel. Your journey to digital freedom starts now. So we can go ahead and start and put in our name and set a password in order to access Citadel. All right, then we will get our backup. So of course we want to safely write down our 24 word seed phrase, store that in a safe place, do not share that ever with anyone. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right, so we have written down our seed words. We are going to keep those safely. This is really nice as well. You can remote access your Citadel using Tor browser and the following onion URL. Okay, and then one last thing, don't be too reckless. Uh, by clicking next, I agree that Citadel is in beta and should not be considered secure. I should not put more funds on my Citadel than I'm prepared to lose. So again, obligatory kind of warnings here. Do be careful, it is early. Go ahead and hit next. And that is it. Citadel is now set up and it is synchronizing the Bitcoin blockchain. And we can go to our dashboard and you will see it looks, you know, again, very similar to Umbral in terms of the different dashboard components. We are synchronizing Bitcoin Core, so it's 0% synchronized, but that will build up over the coming days. And again, this, this process, if you're brand new to syncing uh, the entire Bitcoin blockchain, that takes some time. Certainly depends on the speed of your internet connection, but is typically going to take a couple days. So just sort of let that let that baby run. Once that's complete, we'll be able to load up our Bitcoin wallet with some sats. We'll be able to open some channels 
and start using Lightning through our node and click on this little Bitcoin tab and see some different options. That's really nice. We've got the Lightning tab where you can visualize and see your different payment channels. You can open channels, etc. This is pretty cool. You can get a Lightning address and then there's a variety of ways you can connect your node to all sorts of different wallets. Maybe you're using Sparrow, for example, and you want to connect your node so that you're not relying on someone else's node to fetch information for you about the blockchain. Uh, there's the App Store, similar to Umbral. So there's already uh, quite a few in here, which is great to see to access your node through other means, maybe other than the Tor onion address we copied earlier. And then Nervati is very cool. This is the future of Citadel. So pretty cool what they're working on there. There's some good uh, Twitter threads on this that I will link in the description down below if you wanna take a look. Uh, but as you can see, you know this version of Citadel will continue to receive security updates through at least 2025. So this is definitely something that is in the works, but exciting to note. And then you can always come up to the top right. You can switch to dark mode if you want. That looks pretty clean. And so there we have it. We're gonna let this bad boy run and synchronize. Uh, we'll probably come back and do a more thorough tutorial of Citadel in the future once this is all synced. But pretty cool stuff. We have built our very own Qubit node, installed Citadel. With all that, let's go ahead and conclude today's video. All right, so there you have it. Now, some of you may run into a little quirk that I did where for some reason it must have been in the Ubuntu installation process. I had somehow misconfigured the logical setup of the drives. And so what was happening was Citadel was only reading 100 gigs of space on the drive. And so again, I'm not really sure how that happened. I didn't I didn't deviate, I don't think, from any sort of standard selections in the installation process. But if you find yourself in a similar position, I am going to put this command uh, that you can use to address that. So you just run this from the command line as you're SSH'd into your qubit, and that will correctly partition and you know set up the drives. Uh, because you will, of course, need more than 100 gigs to fully sync the blockchain. So I just wanted to mention that. But all in all, very cool stuff. Again, some of you will opt for the plug-and-play version of this. Some of you will opt for the do-it-yourself. I think in either case, hopefully this was helpful and insightful to understand what is going into this machine. It really does pack a punch. And the optionality you have with those additional drive slots really is something quite unique. So be sure that you're subscribed because I will definitely be covering uh, content in the future on different apps that you can find on Citadel. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What do you think of the Qubit? Have you run other types of nodes? Have you run into issues? What do you like about them? What do you not like about them? And again, if you're interested in the Qubit in either of those flavors, do it yourself or plug and play, go check them out on Geyser. This really is an impressive effort totally grassroots. There's no funding behind this, right? It's all community driven. And so I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, use the share feature underneath this video that really does help get this to a broader audience and make people aware of this excellent new set of tools. And if you are so enamored with this content, you want to donate to a plug, which really does help me continue to make content like this. You can do so in a number of ways. If you happen to be using something like the Get Albi browser extension, you can just click that. It'll automatically detect that you're watching my channel. You can send some sats that way, or you can donate some sats to my lightning address, me at www.enmajor.xyz. And then lastly, some of you have asked how you can get in touch with me, perhaps for deeper questions. Again, I'm gonna continue to be active on the comments, but sometimes it's a lot to keep up with. And so if you want sort of priority or you have a deeper question, or you want some hand-holding on a setup, or whatever it is, you can reach out to me on Vita. Vita is an awesome platform. So I'll leave all of that in the description down below along with the links for everything that we covered. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave things here. As a reminder, every sat counts. And until next time, my friends, I'll see you then.